when it comes to the fight against insurance companies, large corporations, and the healthcare industry, injured victims are always the underdog. But that doesn't worry us. At Messon Associates, we're an injury law firm from Philadelphia, and we come to fight. Our clients know that they've got representation with a chip on its shoulder, and it's the same chip that makes Philly the toughest city in the country. Call 215-568-3500 or visit us online at messalaw.com. Mesa & Associates, the toughest injury firm in Philadelphia. G-L-E-S Eagles Eagles fans, welcome back to another edition of Football 24-7. I'm your guy, Tony DeShields II, and I'm joined by none other than our Philadelphia Eagles insider, John McMullen. John, they are working you hard today, man. But before we get into that, smash that like button, Eagles fans. Make sure you guys are subscribed to the Jacob Sports YouTube channel. You guys know we got you covered. You guys know we're going to we're going to always give you guys the best content that we possibly can. Rain, sleet, or snow, me and John are trained to go. Now, John, once again, they're working you today, man. They're working you. Yeah, um, obviously, we have some breaking news across the board, um, Jalen Hurts related and defensive coordinator related. So, man, uh, pick your poison. Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll let you take the lead here. Yeah, man, Jalen Hurts is sick, but uh, that takes a backseat to what the Eagles did, at, uh, essentially making a move at defensive coordinator, uh, Matt Patricia, assuming the play calling responsibilities. Now, from a technical standpoint, Sean Desai for now is going to keep the title of defensive coordinator, but obviously it, it is what it is. And uh, the realization that he's not going to be calling the defensive plays tells you all you need to know. I get a Mike Grove feel with this because Nick Sirianni all week had mentioned, you know, he was essentially, he's got the right people in the building. He hired these people for a reason. And then you get to the eve of the Monday night game in Seattle, which by the way, Sean returns to Seattle was the assistant head coach at, with the Seahawks last year. And he gets that stripped away from him. You know, Eagles have been obviously uh, uh, you're doing your due diligence behind the scenes. And uh, for instance, you know, they clarified that that Sean keeps the title. But until Nick Sirianni addresses this formally and even after, I mean, there's going to be speculation that Jeffrey Lurie and or Howie Roseman were involved in this decision. And honestly, I think rightfully so. They have a history of doing that um, in season. This is crazy to me. 10 and 1 to 10 and 3. I get the disappointment. I've been saying it all week on, on Birds 365. I've been saying it with you on Football 24-7. This happens to every team in the NFL. This is an overreaction to a ludicrous degree in, in, in my estimation, but it is what it is, and they've done it. And this is heading in a negative direction. We haven't even talked about, you know, okay, Jalen Hurts gets sick. He's going to travel to Seattle. He's going to be on a separate charter. They're trying not to get anybody else sick. We haven't mentioned Darius Slay. I thought it was going to have a lazy Saturday at the Novacare Complex. Came Comes out that Darius Slay is going to have arthroscopic knee surgery. Uh, he's going to be out, um, not going on IR, all this kind of stuff happening and and then this on on sunday and and I, I can tell you there were people in that building that weren't expecting it so you know this seems like a fly by the seat of the pants decision 
And I don't think it's coming from the head coach. Now, I'll say it mm. right now. When the head coach talks in Seattle, he's going to pretend it's his his decision. Of course. You know, I I, I revert people back to uh, Mike Rose firing. And Doug Peterson said he's going to be back. And all of a sudden he had to, to rewind, uh, whether it was 24 or 48 hours later, and say he was fired because he was ordered to fire him. Okay. And Sean's going to be in this organ. I can't imagine he's going to be in the organization long term, um, for whatever reason. And and that's silly because I put out there, and you got all the nothing. You know, Twitter is what it is. X is it what it is. Everybody likes to make their comments, but you know, when you say somebody's still the defensive coordinator, but Matt Patricia's the play caller, it's not going to go over well. Understandably so. Technically. When the coordinators talk next week, it, it'll be Sean decide what's he going to talk about. He can't call the defensive plays, but we'll see how that shakes out. And and we'll see if Sean accepts it, too. I mean, you know, this can't be a good situation for him. Um, and as I said, long term, I can't imagine he's with the organization next year. But short term, you know, we'll see if he sticks it out. You know, John, you know, we covered a lot just in the past few minutes, man. Um, Matt Patricia taking over for Sean Desai, this, uh, uh, Jalen Hurts taking a separate charter so he doesn't get anyone else sick. Um, the fact that this decision came from up top rather than Nick Sirianni, and Nick Sirianni is going to try to play like it, it was his decision. Well, um, I don't know. The court, I'm not reporting well, that. Well, 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 no, no, no. Of, of course. No, I'm sorry. You, you know, well, you would think clear. if it uh, – Allegedly. If were, allegedly. Yeah. If you would think if Nick um, – was thinking about this, he would have couched his comments earlier in the week a little bit better, right. a little more open ended, more than we're 10 and three. I got the people in the building to turn this around. I hired these people for a reason. That was essentially his quote. And then, and that was Monday and Sunday. You're making a change like this now. You, you which can, which, which kind of implies this. There's no way a decision like this happens without Harry Roseman and Jeffrey Lurie's stamp of approval. I mean, um, again, you know, we, we covered so much in such a short amount of time. You know, let's let's kind of take it step by step, right? So let's 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 stay on the defensive side because I think that's the main thing. The Philadelphia Eagles defense has relatively been, let's just say, prior to the bye, up and down, right? Good games, bad games, good halves, bad halves, but. To me, their best stretch defensively was between week five and week seven. That was Los Angeles, the Jets game, and my and the Miami game. And when you saw that, especially in the Miami game, you you felt like they were kind of turning a corner a bit. And then you and then you see the Kansas City game and the Dallas game. Okay, you held Dallas to twenty three points. That's below their that's below their season average. Kansas City, you shut them out in the second half. You saw some things about this defense that you said that you said to yourself, okay, maybe they have something going here. But then Buffalo. And then San Francisco, and then Dallas, and it kind of seemed like a fast fall for Sean Desai. I mean, I'm let's be honest: the defense hasn't been playing up to par after the bye. The defense has been giving up a significant amount of rushing yards, way more than they have in the first part of the season. It just, it kind of <clears> seemed like this was kind of looming, but also at the same time, when you couple that with Matt Patricia being in the building from the from the get go, it kind of already gave you a sense that Desai was on a short lease. Is is is, is that fair to say? Um, well, obviously it's fair to say now, if you would ask me before today, was it fair to say, I would say no, mm. um, 10 and three is 10 and three. And I said it during the week, you don't fire people when you're 10 and three. Um, I go last year with Ed Donatel. That was one of the worst defenses I ever saw in my life. They didn't fire him until after the season because they finished whatever, 13 and four or whatever. Because they were winning games. You don't fire people at 10 and 3. Now, technically, they haven't fired them. Um, would you make a change after the season? Sure. You you start to think about it if you're underachieving. To do it at this point, um, a day before a game, um, yeah, it's, a game. It's, it's, it's knee jerk. Now, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, it's definitely knee jerk. Now, maybe maybe they handled, maybe they made this decision earlier in the week and it just came out today. Jay Glazer was the first one to report it. Mm. Um, so I'll give Jay the credit. Um, 
So maybe it was in the works behind the scenes. Maybe it's been going that way all week. Players certainly didn't let on to any of that. Nick Sirianni certainly didn't let on to any of that. And again, he handled it poorly if this was the plan earlier in the week. Because, because Sean Desai did. spoke to you guys earlier this week, right? Yeah. Uh, business as usual. Monday, Nick doubled down. Uh, Wednesday, everything was pushed back a day. So that was coordinator day. Sean Desai spoke like the coordinator. So Sean Desai um, spoke on Wednesday, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This decision had to be made between then and now. It had to be. There's no way it was made prior to Wednesday. Well, and, and there, anything could be on the table. I mean, he could have known it and not said anything. Nick could have known it and not said anything, but I don't believe that. I don't believe that for a second because so right. one of the players would have said something. Um and I don't even know if it's a bad decision. Matt's probably a better coach. He's certainly more accomplished. He's he's a great defensive, and people will forget about it because. And I don't think that's what you're saying. I don't think you're implying that it's a bad decision. I think you're just saying it's a hasty <clears throat> decision. Is that fair to say? Um, it's it's look you 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 do things for a certain reason. If you wanted. Matt Patricia to be the defensive coordinator at the beginning of the season, hire Matt Patricia to be the defensive coordinator. Mm -hmm. um, they hired Sean Desai for a reason. Um, if you go all the way back to when he was hired, um, you know, probably the easiest way to go would have been elevating Denard Wilson, who was Jonathan Gannon's right-hand man. But, from what I was told, Denard wanted to shift a little bit away from some of the Bangio, Bangio style schemes they prefer. Mm. Um, and that's why they went to Sean Desai as a direct disciple of Big Bangio. And if, if the timing, let's be honest, if the timing worked out with uh, JG in Arizona, um, still battling the cold, by the way. I apologize. If no, no, you're fine. For you're a second. Fine. Um, if 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 the timing worked out, Vic would be here. Vic would be the defensive coordinator. So that part's probably true, but um, it didn't. And they wanted to go forth um, with uh, a similar mindset, and that's why the decision was made to go away from Denard and go towards Sean Desai. You can debate that. I'm not a big fan of the scheme. I'm, I'm I'm very honest about that. I probably would have kept an art um, and who knows where things would go. But I will say, and this is where I really criticize the Eagles, whether it's Nick Sirianni um, making the decision, Howie Roseman, Jeffrey Lurie, whomever. Um, boy, this is this is this is like this is like overreacting like a fan. Mm. This is th this is the assumption that they're better than what they're performing on the field, and it's the coach's fault that they're thirty second and third down defense and they're thirtieth um, in red zone defense, and that he could magically turn that back seven into you know what they were last year, and and people overstated. Um, not overstated. They under sort of realized what losing five defensive starters meant, what losing the coordinator meant, and the assumption that, oh, these guys are just going to step in and do the same things, I think was a fallacy from day one, but I didn't think it would be this bad. So it it's... Fair or not, it's a performance, and Brian Johnson says this, it's a great quote, it's a process-driven profession, you got to stick to your process, but it's a result-oriented decision-making. In other words, you're, you know, you're, it's like me and Jody Mack, I'm a context guy, he's a bottom line guy. Mm. And, and, and that's why you guys is, work, by the way, that's why you guys work. <laughs> and the bottom line is, you could be doing everything right. But if the bottom line doesn't show what, in this case, Jeffrey Lurie wants it to be, you're going to be out the door. And that's, and everybody knows it. 
coaching, every coach has a shelf life. We're seeing the end of Bill Belichick's shelf life in real time. Uh, you know, he's got six Super Bowl rings. Um, everybody's got a shelf life. And if you don't, if you don't perform, and we know the expectations of this team, um, you're out the door. And Sean's not quite out the door, but he's out this of seems, a power this, position. This, this this seems like a precursor to a firing to me. Uh, um, he, he, that, there's no way he's coming back to this organization next year. None. There's no way. And we None. talked about this throughout the week. Um, Rob Ellis and I talked about it. Uh, Dan Cilio and I talked about it. And we discussed, you know, who could potentially would be out of out of both coordinators, who's most likely to be on the outs. And initially, when we had that first conversation, my mindset was Brian Johnson, because at the very least, Sean Desai could fall back and say, well, at least I'm, I don't have the talent on that side. Right. So maybe maybe that was his saving grace that he didn't have the talent. And Brian Johnson did have the talent, yet the offense still had this this uh, ineptness about it. But here we are today. And Sean Desai, and, th and th this is a pseudo firing to me. This is this is a demotion masked as, or this is a firing max masked as, as as a demotion to me. Yeah, I mean, there's no other way to look at it. I'm going to be interested to see Sean Desai go up there. It's probably going to be Wednesday again this week because they play on Christmas, um, but the schedule's not out yet. Um, might be Friday because they, they were really weird week coming off a Monday night game. But he's got to talk to us as the defensive coordinator. Like Matt Patricia, that's another thing. Matt Patricia not only gets to be the defensive play caller, he doesn't have any accountability because he doesn't have to talk with us because technically he's not the defensive coordinator. Now, being the cynical reporter I am, I think that's part of it. Because I asked to talk to Matt Patricia in training camp. I didn't get to talk to him. Nobody has talked to my knowledge. Matt Patricia hmm. got here. And now he's got, he does not have the responsibility of talking to the media each week because he's not the defensive coordinator. They're relieving him of culpability of if, 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 if the thing goes sideways. Correct. Correct. Now the thing's already sideways, but at least Sean decides he's got to go up there and be accountable. Now, People can listen to the press conferences and he doesn't answer much. And there's a lot of coach speak, but at least you got to go up there and you got to go through it. He doesn't have to go through it. So there's a as little part of me that says that's part of it as well, that they don't want to name Matt Patricia um, as the defensive coordinator. So he doesn't have that responsibility. Um, yeah, you, is, you've covered you've covered this game for a while, John. What message does this send to your players? Oh, it's a horrible uh, message. It's a hard. This team's coming apart at the seams because they lost two games, and 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 that is Jeffrey Lurie and Howie Roseman. Make no mistake. I mean, this is overreactive to a ludicrous degree. Th this team still got the best record in football entering this weekend, right? Tied, obviously, but still got the best record in football. Right. I got you. And yeah, they were two bad losses. Nobody's trying to spin that. And certainly against two, two of the best opponents losses. in the league. I mean, it was it was it, was, it wasn't. You know, it, it, they were bad losses, but they also were to the best teams in the league, who are who are arguably two of the hottest teams in the league. Um, it it was. I don't think defense was the only reason they they lost those games, right? Um, I think I would tend to agree with you. It's definitely a massive uh, knee-jerk reaction because at this point in the season where you're kind of where you're trying to gear up for the playoffs the last thing you need is a lack of continuity yeah i mean you want you want to you you know nick you it's obviously lip service at this point but he handled it the way he should have handled it um you want to you want to show a steady hand in times of turmoil um and he did that in front of the microphone now behind it all hell is breaking loose and that's an indication that's not a good indication um and you know part of it is not help you can't help darius slave darius has been 
can't call him Darius. Um, Slay's been playing through um, a knee injury for the majority of the year. Go back to the Jets game. That's why he missed the Jets game. He was dealing with it. And he took it as far as he could, and he had to get arthroscopic surgery um, in the hopes of getting back for the playoffs or or late in the season, um, which he should be back. They're not going to place him on injured reserve. You can't help that. You can't help Jalen Hurts getting sick. Um, you can't help, you know, one 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 piece of good news, Avante Maddox is going to start his practice window this week, so hopefully – Maybe he can get back to the end of the season. Um, Zach Cunningham, you can't help. Uh, Cam Jurgens getting a peck injury. Sue Opet is going to start in Seattle. Uh, Shaq Leonard's going to start. Kaylee Ringo's going to start at cornerback. Can't help those things. Um, I don't see where this ends well for the Philadelphia Eagles, especially on the defense side of the ball. Um, like you said, this team seems to be coming apart at the seams over, uh, since, since these past two losses. And this week has just been eventful all across the board. You have people um, uh, kind of, in my opinion, blowing uh, the fumble drills out of proportion, if you ask me. Um, they practice fumble drills every week. They practice, they practice fumble drills prior to the season, if you ask me. But this week has been this uh, this supreme emphasis on uh, the Philadelphia Eagles in their fumble drills and quarterback doing the up downs with the football, making sure he doesn't lose the ball. It's just, and, and then Nick Sirianni making an appearance on the Rich Eisen show, a national show at that. Um, it, it, it's Jordan Milada uh, making an appearance, I think, on WRP. This week has just been so fascinating for the Philadelphia Eagles, and they're giving you a lot to bite your teeth into. Yeah, and and most of it, as I said, not good. Um, I mean, you know, WIP is their flagship station. So, you know, that's typical. They're contractually obligated to provide people to WIP. But so that's not out of the ordinary. But, um, you know, Nick, you know, doing Rich's show is not that out of the ordinary either. Uh, high profile show. Um you know, they mainly talked about the tush push. Who cares? Um, that's a non-entity. Um, but when you talk about stuff like this, yeah, I mean, this is on a whole different level. This is there's like tweaks. You talk about the fumble drills. The reason the fumble drills, <clears throat> they they changed it up. And Nick said this, he was going to change it up, and uh, because they were getting stripped from behind, uh, AJ Brown, Devontae Smith, so. Yeah, they, they have ball security drills, but they tweaked them. So they shifted right. it towards the emphasis on, on you know, protecting the ball from behind as you're going right. down to the ground. But, but fumble drills are not an anomaly for this Philadelphia Eagles team. No, they do it every day, but they shift them as, the, as needed. Um, right. And they shifted them this week because of what went on in Dallas. That's a tweak. And that's, you know, not that big of a deal. They practice. They were – set to have a walkthrough on Thursday. Um, and they changed it to a padded practice, you know, to get some of the younger players up to speed because of injury issues and all that. That's a tweak. Um, taking the play calling away, defensive play calling from Sean Desai is a seismic shift. That's that's not a tweak. That's a, That's a big thing. And it's week 15 of an 18-week season. And you're one of the best teams in football. Sounds like scapegoating to me. Um, and if you're asking me of the brain trust of, of this um, this organization, and, and by the way, you know, you the all of our YouTube shows are are archived and on the platform and on Jacob Sports. I normally have very good things to say about Jeffrey Laurie as an owner. But I also point out during the Doug Peterson regime specifically, when things don't reach his expectations, he goes looking for scapegoats. This looks like a scapegoating situation to me. 
And in season, the difference is he's never done it. He never really does it in season. Doing it in season, that's that's a, elevating. That's a shot across. That's a shot across the bow. You, you said you said he tends to look for the scapegoat when things aren't necessarily aren't necessarily meeting his expectations. You know, um, you also said earlier that um, changing a play caller. Um, basically does not just solve the issues with this defense. So so let me approach it from this perspective, right? By stripping Sean Desai of the defensive play calling duties, which Im implying that he's the reason why they're not reaching their pinnacle, that takes the attention of Harry Roseman, who has miscalculated uh, several points on the side of the defense. And um, it, 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 take, it, it takes the spotlight off of Harry Roseman for um, – Try, maybe doing the best he could to try to salvage what this defense had left from the previous season, but also he had he had a few miscalculations. And you know, to me, based on everything that we've discussed here, this especially the scapegoating part, Sean Desai is taking the heat for a Howie Roseman miscalculation. That's what it looks like to me. Well, I I mean, yeah, they have personnel issues on the back end, but you know, everybody has personnel issues. Um, nobody is a perfect team. Um so the Eagles process is is pretty sound as far as where they build long term. It can look bad in certain instances. You'd like to have we talk about it all the week with running back and linebacker all the time. We talk about it. would it be great to have uh, uh, Christian McCaffrey as your running back? Sure. Would it be great to have Bobby Wagner in his prime or Fred Warner at linebacker? Sure, of course it would. But, you know, and, and we'll use the 49ers as an example. Well, they drafted their quarterback in the seventh round, so they're paying them a buck and a quarter. And, you know, you can afford during that short shelf life to pay some other positions that you probably can't pay when you have to pay your quarterback on uh, astronomical sums. So uh, everybody's a little bit different. Um, and the Eagles value, and I think correctly so, the offensive, defensive fronts uh, more so than anything else. But yeah, and 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 that's the macro. The micro is when you can't run the football, and people are showing up in front of the Novacare complex saying "run the ball," and you have no linebackers. <clears throat> it can look bad. So it is what it is. But right. <clears throat> 10 and 3 is 10 and 3. There are four teams that are 10 and 3. There are a bunch of teams playing today. You saw um, Minnesota lost a bad game yesterday. Green Bay and Tampa Bay was just watching. They're all 7 and 6, 6 and 7, fighting for their playoff lives. They're not firing coordinators. Right. You know, it, generally you fire coordinators when there's dysfunction in season. Um, you saw it in Pittsburgh with um, um, Matt Canada. Uh, Matt Canada. It, there's dysfunction. There was no evidence of dysfunction with this group. Now there is. Yeah. Now there is. But the evidence of dysfunction is pointing upward. It's not mm. on the coaching staff. It's not. Um, it's pointing upward, and that's interesting. Howie Roseman and Jeffrey Lurie. But you know. That's just speculation. Right. Really quickly, uh, I want to address one of our members, uh, Jacob Sports. A lot of these guys, you know, they pay a little fee to make sure they're a member of the channel. We appreciate you guys for liking the content. One of our members here, um, he says something really <clears throat> interesting. Um, I want I want to address it. He says, uh, Tone, you agreed with Sills about the lack of experience at the coordinator position. Now you're acting like there's a problem. <clears throat> now, here's the thing, right? Um, thank you for um, chiming in for the eyes. We, um, we really appreciate you for liking on the content. Um, I want to clear the air with this with, with this uh, with this chat because I think context is everything. Uh, what we were discussing when you start your season off with coordinators who have little to no experience at their roles, yeah, that was an issue for me. But when you're in week 15 and you go from a guy like Sean Desai who's been with you again for 15 weeks calling the plays, and then you all of a sudden make a shift to a guy who, yes, has more experience. That move can cause more damage than it can repair. Because, again, week 15, 
this isn't week one or week two we're talking about here, right? Where he has time to kind of work out the kinks. We're talking week 15, you're making this shift. So sure, he's swapping a guy with less experience off or a guy with more experience, but week 15 is not the time to do so. So I think that's the that's the disconnect between you and I, Philly Oz, the fact that, yes, I did disagree with the fact that you had guys with less experience up there. But you, but at the end of the day, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. The guys you brought in for war, you go to war with those guys. But in week 15, in the midst of war, you all of a sudden are changing your general or changing your corporal or your captain. That's a recipe for disaster. So again, like John said, this decision, maybe it could prove better in the long run. We really don't know. But as of today, on December 17th at 2.32 p.m. Eastern time, this decision is hasty. It's knee jerk and it points as a sign of dysfunction at the end of the day. But again, Philly Oz, I appreciate you for liking <clears> on the <throat> content. Um, your support is always appreciated. Um, John, uh, moving the needle, uh, moving the needle forward. Um, Nick Sirianni in, in this situation, we talked about how the dysfunction looks like it's coming from the top. What does this move look like or how does this move sort of affect how Nick Sirianni is perceived in his organization because again we don't know for sure who made oh, the decision but I think you be, are... this could be the start I remember sitting in a bar in Minneapolis after okay. Super Bowl 52 you know saying having a having a drink after a long night and um saying to some people all right, well, Nick Sirianni's never, I'm, I'm, excuse me, Doug Peterson is never going to have to buy one of these things again in Philadelphia. Uh, lifetime dispensation card is how I uh, phrased it at the time. Well, the lifetime turned into three seasons, um, um, three years um, before, again, and I, you, you could, you could point directly to what I was talking about with Mike Rowe. Now, I'm not saying Mike Rowe should have been um, the offensive coordinator that Doug should have kept him. That can all be debated because I know fans didn't like Mike as well. Um, but I know Doug wanted to keep him, and I know Doug had, had, should have had the right to keep him because he's the Super Bowl winning coach. Um and by the way, still remains the only Super Bowl winning coach in the history of this franchise. Um, and he didn't get that. Um, he didn't get that leash. And it pissed him off. Flat out pissed him off. And he had to go in front of us one day and say, Mike, will be back. And then a couple of days later, he had to go in front of us and explain why Mike wouldn't be back. Fast forward. That, that completely undermines Doug Peterson, by the way. Completely yes. undermines him. Fast forward to Monday, where Nick Sirianni said, Monday of this week, understand, said he had, quote, total confidence in Sean Desai. That's why we hired him for the job. That's Monday of this week. Said, I have the guys in the building. I believe in them. Fast forward to Sunday. All of a sudden, it's play calling. Not fired, but the play calling is taken away. Now, I also go back to after the, the Doug Peterson's last season. You remember, Jeffrey Lurie didn't fire him right away. They right. didn't get to interview Brandon Staley, luckily. They didn't get to – they wanted to interview Robert Sala, who came in and interviewed Arthur Smith, all the hot candidates. They were late to the process. Because Jeffrey didn't make the decision. Now, when did Jeffrey make the decision? Doug came in with his plan, which was going to be Press Taylor uh, as the offensive coordinator. Um, Matt Burke as the defensive coordinator. Jeffrey didn't like it. It said, you can come back as head coach, but... But you can't bring those guys. You're going to have to reevaluate your coaching staff. And Doug... Stemming from the Mike Rowe issue said, you know what? I'm out of here. F you. I'm out of here. Um, so in other words, oh, yeah, Doug, you can come back, but you can only come back if you hire the guys we want you to hire. Pretty much. Um, so I don't know if we're at the start of that again with 
um, Nick Sirianni, but I think it's fair to point out we might be at the start of that again. Who was the, by your estimation, based off your experience covering this team, who, by your estimation, was the strongest uh, pusher for Sean Desai to be the DC in this organization? Howie. If you had, if, if you had to pick, an, okay, Howie. Okay, Howie. Well, what, what? So what? What goes on if Nick? Nick had, you know, there are certain guys Nick was very close to. Um, Kevin Petullo, uh, most notably. Um, so when he got the job, he had a bunch of guys he wanted to bring in, but there were some positions he didn't have um, people in place for. And how we sort of Brian Johnson would be an example of this. He would go out and find Nick a, a group of candidates for a uh, respective position and Nick would interview them and make the decision on who he wanted to hire. But finding the candidates is Howie's job. So similar thing the, happened. Nick, Nick, really quick. I'm, I just want to make sure I understand. Howie would, it, it, when Nick got here, um, and Nick had certain people there in place that he wanted to provide, that he wanted to bring. But for those that he didn't, a la Brian Johnson, Howie would go out, find him a group of candidates. Nick would then interview them. And then Nick would then relate to how we, uh, uh, <clears throat> this is the guy I would prefer. And then how yeah, we ultimately, yeah. ultimately makes, makes the decision. Uh, uh, Nick makes the decision to this point. Like he wanted to hire Sean Desai, but okay. he didn't find Sean Desai, the candidates, uh, how he did. Um, okay. Not that he didn't know him, but it's just how he's one of how he's responsibilities to gather candidates. Um, and to this point, you know, Nick's been given that autonomy to make the decision. Did he fire? Uh, well, nobody fired Sean Desai because he's still in the organization. Demo but he, did, he demote. did he demote Sean Desai? I'm sure he's going to say he did. Do but I your gut's telling did? you. No, my gut is telling me no, he did not. This is Howie Roseman's team, isn't it? This is the, like, because let's be honest, the, the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, over the past several years, they have uh, they they've had winning coaches. Whoever they bring in, they win, right? Um, now to what level do they win? That's always debatable, and the result always dictates that. But for the most part, this uh, this this organization, they go out and find coaches, and if you're not playing ball or playing up to par to their standard, they'll get you out of here regardless of what you've accomplished. So this is how this is how we rolls. Well, obviously Jeffrey Lurie is the owner, but. This is Harry Roseman's um, show that he's kind of pulling the strings here. What, what, what would you say to that? Well, no, it's Jeffrey's show. I mean, you know, Howie, for instance, uh, recommended Josh McDaniels to be the head coach in um, 2021. And Jeffrey wisely put the kibosh on that. Um, <laughs> and I think that was a smart decision. So it's not like he makes bad decisions. I've, I've, I've all bad decisions not make he makes all good decisions, but, um, you know, the standpoint from what I was told there is that, you know, they promised they would get along and they promised they could work together. Uh, Josh McDaniels and Howard Roseman and Jeffrey wisely assumed that no matter what they say today, they're probably going to butt heads in the future. I agree with them. Uh, so he probably made the right decision and, uh, the search continued. Ultimately, he was going to continue it till he found somebody he liked, and, and he found Nick Sirianni. Uh, ultimately, that was a good decision. I do think it, it's, and when we go through this process, and, and nobody should be talking about it, and the only reason we're talking about it is because of stuff like this. Mm. But everybody has a shelf life. At, at one point down the road, Nick Sirianni will not be the head coach of the Philadelphia Eagles. I can't tell you when that's going to be. It shouldn't be anytime soon. Um, his record is what his record is. If you want to talk about bottom lines, if you want to go the Jody Mack route, his bottom line is pretty freaking impressive. Um, so the Eagles shouldn't be thinking about the next coach anytime soon. But Sirianni should be mindful after what's, what's happened today. I would be. I, my antenna would be up um, because if they start pushing the scapegoating, like if, if let's just say this goes in a negative direction, the Eagles 
finish out the season. Maybe they go two and two. Uh, the schedule's so bad, I can't imagine them collapsing completely. Um, first round exit in the playoffs. Um, there will be the push for scapegoats. Um, Sean would be one of them, obviously. Um, but maybe some more assistance as well. Mm. Um, you know, defensive backs coaches, they have three of them, for instance. Um, you know, now they're crossing their fingers. Kaylee Ringo hasn't played all year. Now he's got to go out and play um, 60 some odd snaps if you're lucky because they've been playing 80 uh, against DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett. Well, good luck, Mr. Ringo. Um, you know, so start looking for scapegoats if if things if the eagles don't turn this around and go to where they're expected to go and let's be honest super bowl or bust and it has been from day one with this team all right john we'll close it with this um eagle seahawks uh tomorrow night um obviously we spent most of this episode talking about uh the short uh the short decide matt patricia um swap the deal switcheroo um, but there is a game on Monday. Um, let's close it with this. Um, what's uh, what's your overall um, assessment of that matchup? Um, how do you see it playing out? Um, just give me your breakdown of Eagles versus Seahawks. Well, I don't know what to think now. I don't know if the quarterback's <laughs> playing. I don't. I don't know if the freaking. Uh, I don't know what's going on with the defense. Look, Seattle's got their own issues. Uh, you know, there's no guarantee still that Geno Smith is going to play. If it's true lock, that's going to make things easier. Um, for Matt Patricia, and who knows, maybe they have a good defensive game because Drew Locke is playing, and all of a sudden, Matt's going to be the savior. Um, and and by the way, Matt's a really good coach. If you want to ask me, well, who should be the defense coordinator? You know, going back from day one, I'd say Matt Patricia. Well, I would say Denard Wilson. You know, that's who I thought was going to get the job at first, right? Because they valued continuity so much and they elevated Brian Johnson. And obviously, well, they like got a I late said, start. He wanted, on he wanted to shift away from some of the, not completely, but some of, he wanted to add some wrinkles in that weren't Fangio specific. And they're obsessed with this freaking defensive scheme. And Nick talked about, I asked him about this on, on Saturday. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Um, and it, it it's Nick Sirianni driven because he he said it again he he approaches it from an offensive uh, guy's perspective. So his thought process is, and this is where um, Sean McVay had the same thought process when he hired Brandon Staley. He said same thing. You could have said the same words out of Sean McVay's mouth. It is the most difficult to deal with defensive scheme from their perspective at the time at the time so they wanted somebody to run the defense that way because it was difficult on them um sports constantly evolving too many quarterbacks too many teams have gotten a look at this scheme um and i think things have shifted so you know, Denard wanted to evolve and shift a little bit with that, not go completely away from it, um, but just do some different things. And that's why I was told. Right, had some Eagles tendency went, breakers. Yeah, and, and that's why the Eagles went in a different direction. Um, and he's now uh, the secondary coach in Baltimore. Um, I would have hired him. and But then even if you get to um, – the, the the Patricia versus the Cy dynamic. I mean, Matt's a proven, but again, he doesn't play the Fangio scheme. We'll see how that shakes out. Um, I'm glad maybe. you said that really quickly. I'm so glad you said that because we, and we can end it with this, right? The Eagles are pretty much defensively, right? The, yes, they're ten and three. They're ten and three. They're ten and three. But defensively. They're essentially at the bottom of every meaningful category defensively. So, yeah, and that's what like, I guess that begs the question. Situational football. So, right. You know. right. So, so I, I guess that begs the question: How bad can things get from this point? Right. I mean, it can only. Well, they're go not. Up. That, that that's the beauty of it. If you're mm. from, it can't get worse because you're playing um, 
perhaps Drew Locke, and even if you're not, I mean, Gino's so banged up, and Seattle's not playing well to begin with. Then you got Tommy Cutlets twice, and the the Arizona Cardinals, who can do some things with Kyler Murray, but who knows where they are as far as you know? Do they even want to win at this stage? Um, the schedule's so bad, you have to get better. So from that standpoint, maybe you get the fan base rallied back on your side because they're not going to look at the context of that. You know how I know that? People are going to yell at me, but you know how I know that? Because they did that in the context (laughs) of San Francisco and Dallas. Like San Francisco (laughs) might as well be Tommy DeVito and company. And Dallas, because everybody's the same. It's not about the other team. And I'm not, that's every fan base. It's not just Philadelphia. But they never look at the context of the other team. Those are two of the best offenses in the NFL. And yeah, the Eagles got beaten up pretty badly. Um, You could argue in Dallas, (laughs) they actually held them under what they usually score at AT (laughs) AT&T Stadium. Um, But nonetheless, the context is going to be missing. And they're going to say, oh, the defense has been pretty good. Mark my words, Tone, over the pa- over the last month, heading into the playoffs, the defense has been pretty good. But then you now, say what? Nothing to do Who with Tommy play? DeVito. <laughs> uh, you know, so just be forewarned of that. They load. Hey, listen, um, uh, uh, Matt Patricia is dealing with um, a loaded deck in his favor. I'll put it to you that way. <laughs> Man, yeah. this is... um. This has been a hell of a day, John. Um, they got you working hard, man. They got you working on a Sunday when it's potentially could have been a chill day for you, man. This is uh the yeah. Philadelphia Eagles always keep you on your toes. I thought and, Saturday uh, was gonna be a chill day, and then I got blindsided with Slay surgery and Jalen's not yeah. at practice, and Josh Sweat's not at practice. Didn't even mention Josh. Um, he, he missed practice for a personal issue. He's expected to play, so we'll see how it shakes out. But for this particular move, that's the biggest part. Uh, to cut through any bullshit narrative coming from the Eagles, Matt Patricia now runs the defense, calls the defense, so he's not going to be the defensive coordinator in title, but he runs the defense, calls wow. the defense, just doesn't have to be accountable for the defense. Wow. Um, and, I, I, you know, 10-3 and three team, that strikes me as – Pure, pure overreaction. You might even go so far as panic. Wow. And this is why you get paid the big bucks, JM, because you're the man with the plan. You're the guy who always has the inside scoop on the Philadelphia Eagles. And your perspective is always refreshing to me because um, as a fan myself of the Philadelphia Eagles, at times I can become overtly emotional. I can be supremely passionate about this team. Um, But Talking to you always grounds me and gives me a a different perspective to, at the very least, uh, consider. Um, So I appreciate you for always doing the work that you do, John. Um, It's greatly appreciated by me. It's greatly appreciated by uh, the fans. And it's greatly greatly appreciated appreciated by Jacob Sports. Eagles fans, there you have it. Make sure you guys smash that like button. Make sure you guys are locked in on Jacob Sports and all the content that we provide. Make sure you catch John on Birds 365 with his partner in crime, Johnny McDonald. Uh, at 8 a.m. Eastern time to 10 a.m. Eastern time. They're going to break this down even more so, and I'm pretty sure Jody Mack is, is going to give you the bottom line. Um, bottom you know, line. With, the, with this whole situation. So, again, you guys, make sure you guys lock in on Jacob Sports tomorrow. We're going to be covering this the entire day on Birds 365, um, on the Philly Sports Power Hour with uh, Bill Colarulo, uh, Sports Take with Rob Ellis and myself, and the National Football Show. Uh, with Dan Cilio. This is this is going to be a hell of a week, you guys. And this is going to be a hell of a game on Monday night. We have no idea what we're going to see from the Philadelphia Eagles defense. <sighs> Buckle up. I'll put it to you. I'll put it to you guys that way. So smash that like button. Make sure you guys are subscribed to Jacob Sports. And also make sure you guys always come back to football 24-7 with John McMullen. And I'm your guy, Tony Shows the second. And we'll see you guys next time. Take care and happy Sunday. When it comes to the fight against insurance companies, large corporations, and the healthcare industry, injured victims are always the underdog. But that doesn't worry us. At Messon Associates, we're an injury law firm from Philadelphia, and we come to fight. 
our clients know that they've got representation with a chip on its shoulder. And it's the same chip that makes Philly the toughest city in the country. Call 215-568-3500 or visit us online at mesalaw.com. Mesa & Associates, the toughest injury firm in Philadelphia.